tonight is that we're going to have a half hour lecture, then there's going to be five minutes of questions, then there's going to be a little break, and then afterwards you can either go outside to do some stargazing on the field that's behind me, or you can stay in here, and there will be a little bit of a Q&A panel with a few experts in astronomy. Um, so, let's see. Uh, so this is a monthly lecture series. Uh, there's a schedule outside. You can grab one of these. Next month, we have Ivana Escala, who's going to give us a talk on the origin of the elements. Um, we will be having this lecture series in July and on throughout the summer as well. Uh, there's also some other cool swag on that table out there. You can get one of these neat uh, NASA images of this galaxy called Centaurus A. You can put it up on your wall. Uh, there's also a little, um, there's a survey if you're interested in giving us some feedback about what you thought about this event, how we could have made it better. Um, so it was a little cloudy, but I think that the, uh, the people who are running the telescopes are still going to try to do the stargazing afterwards. That's the last I've heard. I'll give you another update uh, after the lecture to find, if I find out anything new. Um, uh, just some bureaucratic stuff. No food or drinks or smoking or pets in here or out on the field uh, because they just resurfaced the field and they also don't want high heels because you can poke holes in the astroturf, apparently. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. OK, so uh, let's get started. I've been yammering enough. So tonight's speaker is Dr. Andrew Wetzel. Andrew is a postdoctoral fellow here at Caltech and also up the street at the Carnegie uh, Observatory. Uh, and he's going to be leaving us in the summer to go to be a professor at UC Davis. Uh, so Andrew works on computer, supercomputer simulations to understand how galaxies, including the Milky Way, formed. And that's what he's going to be telling us about today. So please help me to welcome Andrew Wetzel. Thank you, Leo. Can you all hear me all right? All right, so thanks all for coming out tonight. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what I work on and what a lot of my colleagues work on that's maybe a little different from what you've heard from some of the speakers who actually go out to telescopes and look at galaxies. My drive is the flip side, so I'm a theorist, and what I try to do is understand the basic physics behind how galaxies, like our own Milky Way galaxy, forms. And in fact, you can see on this movie here, this isn't a real observed galaxy. This is a recreated galaxy on a supercomputer. And it's great is that these complex simulations allow us to sort of dig into the details of galaxies. We can see them from different angles, from different ways. We can, we can, we can measure their formation across the 14 billion years of evolution of our, of our uh, universe. And uh, as you can see from here, we're at a stage now where, we can, we, where these simulations are good enough where we can provide very realistic uh, mocks of galaxies like, like our own. So again, so maybe you've heard talks before from some of my observational colleagues who go out and use uh, telescopes. So in this case, this is in the summer, southern hemisphere, this is, the, this is the Magellan telescopes. And of course, what you can see if you look up in the night sky, and this is a long exposure image, you can see this streak here. Do you all know what that streak is? Right, that's the Milky Way galaxy. It's a very aptly named galaxy, right? It looks like a streak of milk across the sky. What you're seeing here is just the unresolved light of billions upon billions of stars uh, in the plane of the disk of Milky Way. And so a lot of what I work on is actually trying to use supercomputers to understand how a galaxy, how our own Milky Way galaxy forms. And in fact, that's going to be sort of the theme throughout my talk, and I hope you can come away from this lecture having a better understanding of how exactly did our own Milky Way galaxy form. I think we have a lot of insight now from these large-scale supercomputer simulations that can do an accurate job of modeling the complex processes involved in how a galaxy like the Milky Way forms. So if we want to understand how it formed, we've got to take a step back and think about the beginning. right? So let's talk for a moment about the origin of all the structure in the universe. Where did it come from and how did it, how did it evolve? Right? So let's step back to the first second or the fraction of a second just after the Big Bang. 
Sorry, the Big Bang was the start of our universe, it started the expansion of our universe. And the key, a key point I want you to take away from the talk today is this is where all of the structures in our universe came from. So just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, as you may have heard from, uh, about quantum theory uh, physics, that on quantum scales, the universe is very dynamic, a lot of fluctuating particles coming in and out of existence, a very dynamic regime. But in, our, in sort of thinking about it today, it's limited to very small scales that we don't see we don't interact with normally. But the key insight was that in the very early universe, these small quantum fluctuations underwent a period of extremely rapid expansion we call inflation. And the main point of inflation is just that the universe expanded by an incredible factor by 10 to the 60. That's, that's, that's 1 followed by 60 zeros in size. And the key point is that that very rapid expansion of the universe caused these tiny quantum fluctuations to become macroscopically large, and they got frozen in, and those tiny, tiny quantum fluctuations were seeded in the distribution of matter in the very early universe, again, just a second after the Big Bang. And so those quantum fluctuations got frozen in, and they were the, they were the building blocks, those are the starting points for the formation of all of the structures in the universe, including galaxies. And the way we know this, and the best measurement we have is, and you may have seen an image of this before, this is an image of what we call the cosmic microwave background. So the key is, what this is, is an image of light emitted shortly after the Big Bang. It was emitted just 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And remember, that's 380,000 years compared to the 13.7 billion years of the full history of our universe from the Big Bang until today. And we, the reason we call it the cosmic microwave background is at the present day, we see it in the microwave band. These are the same bands that actually are used in your microwave oven to heat up uh, food. And actually, if you remember those old TVs with uh, rabbit ear antennas and you picked up the static in the background? A lot of that static was actually picking up some of this cosmic microwave radiation that was actually just coming to us today. And if we look at it through telescopes that are sensitive to microwave bands, we see these tiny temperature fluctuations. What this is is a map of the full sky these tiny temperature fluctuations, they're just one part in 100,000. So tiny, tiny temperature fluctuations in the universe correspond to tiny density fluctuations of slightly overdense regions in the early universe. And the key there is these, these great observations that my observational colleagues uh, have given us give us fantastic data on what the initial conditions were of the, early, of the universe, again, just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, so tiny uh, density fluctuations here that we can then take the same sorts of density fluctuations we observe and now put them onto a large computer simulation. I'll describe to you in the details in a moment. So we can start off at the very early universe with these, small with these small density fluctuations and then let them evolve under the force of gravity. And we see something like this. So those tiny density fluctuations come together through gravity, nonlinear gravitational collapse, they get bigger. You can see this filamentary structure forming. We like to call that the cosmic web because it looks a little bit like a uh, spider's web forming in the distribution of matter in the universe. And at the very, and as the, the nodes of these filaments, this web, we have these overdense regions. These are where galaxies are forming in the present day, right? So we can actually see all of the matter in the universe. We'd see something like this, this complex cosmic web structure of galaxies forming out of these tiny, tiny quantum fluctuations that were made big during inflation. All right, so I showed you one of the movies from one of these computer simulations. Now let me tell you a little bit about how we use some of the largest supercomputers in the world to understand how galaxies form. So perhaps your classical view of what theoretical physics, theoretical astrophysics is, is something like this. So, right, we write equations on a blackboard, and those are basically our models for the physical world. And that's certainly still true, and that's still a lot of what we do. But actually, a lot of, in, but a lot of what we do also has shifted to something more like what you see on the right. So instead of just equations on the blackboard, we take those same equations governing gravity, governing electrodynamics, and translate them into computer algorithms that we then sit a computer and code up. And they provide the program that we use to basically put the laws of physics onto a program and model 
regions of the universe. So again, a lot of what we do is quite collaborative now that we work in large teams. We're trying to, main comp we're trying to maintain complex codes, not unlike, for instance, what folks in Silicon Valley working at Google and Facebook would do of trying to maintain their complex algorithms for uh, uh, modeling whatever. In our case, trying to model galaxy formation. <clears throat> and just to give you a sense of the tremendous progress we've made over the last few decades in being able to model more and more complicated ways how the universe evolves, how galaxy evolves, this diagram shows as a function of time or, or, or year the number of particles or the number of resolution elements in our simulations. And you can see going back, say, to the 90s, those cutting-edge simulations at that time only used maybe a billion, uh, sorry, only used maybe a million particles. And there's been tremendous progress such that today the biggest uh, supercomputing simulations of cosmic evolution and of the universe are now reaching a trillion particles. And this line here just shows sort of a trend here that over time there's been a significant increase in how many particles we can get. Perhaps some of you are familiar with Moore's Law. So we begin to piggyback on the tremendous progress of peop people in Silicon Valley building faster and faster and faster and more capable computers. Moore's Law says that every 18 months or so the computing capacity roughly doubles. And so we've benefited tremendously over time in the computational realm as computers get faster and as our algorithms get better, we can simulate more and more complex uh, galaxies in these simulations. And so just to tell you today, uh, the kinds of supercomputers that I've been using uh, for uh, running these simulations. Uh, so this is a list of, uh, you can actually visit this website, top500.org, lists the most powerful supercomputers in the world today. So this shows the top 13. And for instance, in the work that I've been doing, we're using number 10 here. This is the Stampede supercomputer located at the Texas, University of Texas Advanced Computing Center. So this is a supercomputer that has almost half of a million uh, individual cores or individual CPUs on it. And there's also at NASA, there's uh, at NASA Ames Research Center, which is up in Mountain View, there's the Pleiades supercomputer, which has something like 185,000 supercomputing cores. And so our codes now scale to large numbers of cores that we run in parallel. And just to give you some motivation for that, so if I were, if I were to try to run a, a computer simulation on just my laptop here, say a laptop which has a single computing core on it, so in one hour of runtime, that would give me a one CPU hour equivalent of work out of the computer. In a year, there is roughly 9,000 hours. And so if I let this laptop run straight 24-7 for a year, I'd get something like uh, 9,000 CPU hours of work out of it. Some of the simulations I'm going to show you today that I've been running over the last several months require something like 20 million CPU hours to simulate a Milky Way galaxy from the Big Bang until today. If I tried to run that simulation on my laptop, it would take about 200 years to run. So I don't know if you are all familiar with the sort of ways of academia, but it's very difficult to convince a tenure committee to give, you, to give you tenure if it's, let's keep waiting for 200 years until my, uh, until my computer simulation finishes. Whereas, I'm currently running a simulation on the Pleiades computer that's scaling to 5,000 cores. Now we can run it in about six months. Now that's, that's quite doable now. Um, so some of you actually may have heard of the Pleiades supercomputer before. Have you, any of you seen the movie The Martian? Yeah? So do you guys remember the scene from The Martian? Uh, so let's just say this is the Pleiades supercomputer if you haven't seen it. Do you remember the scene from The Martian where uh, Donald Glover's character, he's the dynamicist, he has to compute the orbits uh, to Mars and back, and so he takes his laptop and he actually goes to the supercomputer and then hooks it up by a, a connector here, and then he runs the super, and then he runs the simulation, and at the end a little window shows that says calculations correct. So I really liked The Martian movie and it was scientifically accurate in so many ways, but this is not at all accurate, I have to tell you. <laughs> so first of all, they won't, they won't let me, even though I use Pleiades, they won't let me step foot on the facility because it's NASA, you know, security is really tight. So I show up, they say, no, go away, we won't let you in. They certainly won't let me just walk in with my laptop and connect it up to the uh, supercomputer. That's a no-no. Secondarily, 
we never get the benefit, as nice as this would be, that when I run the simulation, it tells me calculation's correct, game over, you're done, good. No, that's the hard work of us figuring out has it worked or not. So I want to actually show you what it's really like to log on to Pleiades. So I'm just going to take a break from my presentation here. So this is real life. This isn't, this isn't a movie now. So I'm going to pull up, oops, I have to, here we go. I got a little terminal window on my computer. If you aren't familiar with it, it's just a text, it's basically a text way of manipulating the computer. Now I want to log on to Pleiades. However, this is NASA, so they're very anal about security. So I can't just type in a password. I actually have a little app on my phone that I have to type in uh, uh, my password, and it will give me just a single use password to use just once, just now, which is much safer than having a permanent password. So I'm going to type SSH. That's just a, a way of logging onto the machine. PFE stands for the Pleiades front end. That's just the server of logging onto Pleiades. So I get a little, you know, be careful. Hopefully you're not doing anything, you know, dangerous here. I type in this single use password. <laughs> it's one use, so even if I told you, you could never use it again. And there I'm logged in. I'm on the world's 13th most powerful supercomputer right now. So now I can do fun things like move into one of my simulation directories here. I'm running a simulation here, uh, right here. So this just shows the current runs I'm simulating right now. This is a simulation of a Milky Way galaxy. I'll show you uh, results from a similar uh, simulation a little bit later in the talk. This is showing you the name, that it's running. It's using 5,120 cores at once, and it's been running for about a day now. And I get to run up to five days at once, and then I have to resubmit the job. So if I want to submit a job, it's quite easy. I write what's called a submission script. So if any of you are familiar with the Python programming language, a lot of what we do is in Python. I just want to give you a sense of what it looks like. You probably Don't worry if you don't understand it. There's a lot of just uh, 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 text here that just tells it how many computers to use, how long to run, a lot of numerical details, how many nodes to use, how long to run. This is all just basically Python. And I just say, uh, I just say QSub, that's for submit. And I just say the name of the submission script. And I've submitted a job to the Pleiades supercomputer. So that's, that's reality, no, no plugging in. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to show you now what some of these supercomputer simulations look like of trying to simulate our Milky Way. That's basically my goal, is, is how did our Milky Way form? And so we call these simulations the latte simulations because we're simulating the Milky Way with FIRE. FIRE is the name of our collaboration. It stands for Feedback in Realistic Environments. The idea is we're trying to incorporate the very complicated effects of what we call stellar feedback, or essentially the way that stars shining on the galaxies, giving off light in the galaxies, affect the way the galaxies form. And I'll show you a movie of that actually just right now. So this is what this is a plausible way that our actual own Milky Way galaxy formed. On the right, you're seeing the distribution of hydrogen gas. And it's hydrogen gas that flows in and comes together, which is how stars form. And on the left, you're seeing the actual real color image of what the stars would look like. So you can see what's happening is from the large scales, this gas tries to fall in under the influence of gravity. It comes together. And then as these stars are forming, Eventually, they undergo these fantastic explosions you may have heard of called supernova. They're like little nuclear bombs going off in the middle of these galaxies. These bombs shoot all this gas back out of the galaxy. So it's this very complicated and tumultuous process of gas coming in through gravity, but then getting spewed back out through the supernova, in and out, in and out. So it's quite complex, dynamic here. We're about halfway through the evolution of the universe now. And now you're going to finally see this gas is starting to calm down a bit and settle into this rotationally supported disk. It's basically just conservation of angular momentum as the gas tries to fall in, much like as an ice skater, as she's spinning, would pull her arms in to spin faster. As this gas comes in, as it falls into the center, it starts rotating more quickly. And then you see the nice disk-like, Milky Way-like galaxy here starting to form. You're seeing it face on on the left. And then we'll just let this evolve all the way down to the present day this, this notch here is what we call a redshift. 
It's just a unit of measurement in astronomy. When it gets to zero, that means we're through the full evolution of this particular galaxy. That's a, oh, yeah, that's a kiloparsec. So a parsec is about three light years. It's just a unit that astronomers like to use. So this across is about 150,000 light years. That means to say that if a beam of light would take about 150,000 years to cross this physical scale across this galaxy. And there we are. Now we're at the present, now we're at the present day. Um, so let me just do a slightly different visualization of this, of basically the same galaxy. Now we'll just do a fly through and watch it evolve over the last roughly billion years of its evolution. And we can see not just the disk galaxy here, but you can see it's embedded in what we call this extended stellar halo. This is just the diffuse distribution of starlight around it. And then what's quite interesting, I'll say more about, are these tiny little satellite dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around it. So let's just do a zoom in here. You can see that this galaxy is about to undergo a merger with this other one. So gravity is pulling it in. This other thing is getting torn apart into this gravitational tidal stream. We're about to fly through this tidal stream. All right, so we're going at many times the speed of light here, if you want to think about it in terms of the actual speed with which we would move through this galaxy. Now we're inside the galaxy. You can see star forming regions here. You can see the dust here that's causing an attenuation of the light, darker patches. Here we have the nuclear region, the nucleus of the galaxy, forms sort of a little bulge-like region with a spiral structure like we think we have in the Milky Way. Now you can see this tidal stream from that merger is now stretching out hundreds of thousands of light years across this particular galaxy. Some of these satellites come in and merge. They form these shell-like configurations. So you can see the level of detail. This is what you know a few hundred million CPU hours on the world's fastest supercomputers will get you. This level of detail of being able to follow a galaxy like our own Milky Way as it's forming on the on the computer simulation. Just to give you another sense of the realism of these simulations, here's a view from within the Latte simulation, sitting at about the position where the sun would sit within this galaxy. And then here's the same view in on our own Milky Way galaxy. So it doesn't look exactly the same, of course. And we're you're trying to do a more careful mapping of getting a more Milky Way-like systems. But you just get a sense of the qualitative sense of which our ability is to form structures like the observed Milky Way within one of these supercomputer simulations. So actually, I want to highlight one of the most interesting things that come out of this that maybe you might not already be familiar with. but Around our own Milky Way galaxy, there's a, there's a lot of these, what we call dwarf galaxies. The reason we call them dwarfs is they're just really small compared to the Milky Way. And they presented really interesting cosmic mysteries. There's been a big problem trying to understand their formation that goes back 20 years or more. So let me just give you a sense of this. So if, again, if we're zooming out from one of these uh, Milky Way simulations, it's these tiny satellite galaxies that form around us that have been sort of a vexing problem to astronomy for a while now. So let's just set the benchmarks so you understand the size of these galaxies. So if we look at a pretty massive galaxy like the Milky Way, we're looking at a galaxy that has something like 100 billion stars. That's the, that's the size of it. Now we can look at slightly less massive galaxies, slightly dimmer galaxies. Have any been into the southern hemisphere? And you've looked up at the night sky. Do you ever see these fuzzy blobs called the Magellanic Clouds? So if you're ever in the Southern Hemisphere, I encourage you to try to seek these out because you can only see them from the Southern Hemisphere. They look kind of like fuzzy patches in the sky. They're actually satellite galaxies. They're not stars. They're not part of the Milky Way disk. They're separate dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way. They're called the Small and the Large Magellanic Clouds because they were discovered by Magellan as he did his journey around the Earth. So this is dwarf galaxies that have something like a billion stars in them. So they're about 100 times uh, fainter than the Milky Way. But we can go even dimmer around the Milky Way. So if we use some of the world's best telescopes to look uh, deeper, we can find uh, patchy regions like this. This is another dwarf galaxy, an even fainter one. This is called Fornax. So this is only about 10 million stars. And then finally, we can go all the way down to the faintest known galaxies period that were discovered just in the last year or two. We have a galaxy like this from Reticulum 2. That was, again, this was discovered just in the last uh, 18 months or so. 
you kind of can't even see it here. This is basically a bunch of stars in the Milky Way, and there's sort of a background patch here. And you have to use uh, sort of computer searching algorithms to find it. There's a dwarf galaxy right here. But it has only 500 stars. Compare that to the 100 billion stars. These are, these are really faint systems. Um, and they're really interesting because they really push our limits of, you know, what's the, what's the extreme limit of how galaxies form in the universe? These are the faintest things. These are the basic building blocks. And the problem is, if we try to connect our basic theories of how galaxies like our Milky Way form to what we observe, there's a big disconnect in the following sense. So if we look at the number of dwarf galaxies that we observe around the Milky Way here, here's just a map of them. Um, in terms of the bright satellites uh, that are uh, brighter than about 100,000 stars or so, or have more than 100,000 stars or so, there's only about 12 of those around the Milky Way. But if we run sort of previous generations of supercomputer simulations that try to incorporate you know, dark matter and stars and gravity, we measure all of these little knots, something like 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 of these little knots around the center of a Milky Way-like region. So on the one hand, the models were predicting you know, 100,000 little satellite systems, and the observations showed like just 10. So it was like, wow, this is a big disconnect. What's, what's going on? And uh, what's exciting is that these new generation of supercomputer si simulations, some of which I've been involved in, are finally now giving us answers to this problem. So let me show you now. Here's a map of the distribution of dark matter around a uh, Milky Way-like galaxy today from our new supercomputer simulations. This is from LATTE. You see here's a map of the dark matter. I'm just going to flash back and forth, showing you here's the distribution of dark matter. And now here's the actual distribution of stars and luminous light. So they look a little different, actually. So some of the, some of the bright knots of dark matter have stars, like here, here, and here. But some of them don't, like over here, right? And so what we find is, you know, saw that movie before, those complex explosions, those supernova blowing gas around. Well, when we include those models of how stars evolve and how stars die and they explode at their end stages. And that complex gas getting sloshed around actually destroys a lot of these dwarf galaxies that we used to think would have been there. And so we're only left now with a handful of them around, there's basically a, the, the Milky Way disk is buried in there. You can't really see it very well. And so right now, I finished running uh, three different versions of these simulations just so we can get a sense of what the uncertainty in the models are. So we give them, I'll let you guess the naming convention here. We have latte and, and flat white and, and macchiato. If you haven't guessed, we tend to drink a lot of coffee when we work. It's kind of part of our, part of our routine. Um, and then here's the, here's the predictions from our latest generation of supercomputer simulations compared against what we, what we see in the Milky Way. So here's, I'm just counting the number of these satellite dwarf galaxies that are, more, that are more massive or that are brighter than a given stellar mass. So this is 100,000 stars, this is a million stars, this is 10 million, 100 million, and a billion stars. So you can see here, if we look around the Milky Way, there's something like 10 known dwarf galaxies that are above 100,000 stars. And we're looking here around our nearest uh, uh, bright companion galaxy, Andromeda, that has something like 23 of these, these satellite dwarf galaxies. So these are the observations, and now I'm going to show you the results from the computer simulation. Here's the first one I ran, bam, it sits right in the middle of them. Not bad, agreement. And then I ran a few more just to get the uncertainty in the models. The second one sat right down here, so it actually agreed quite, this flat white agreed very nicely with the Milky Way. And then the third, third one I ran sat right up here, so agreed nicely with Andromeda. So within some uncertainty here, we're basically showing really nice agreement now with predicting these number of faint satellite systems around the Milky Way and around our nearest massive companion galaxy, Andromeda. So this is what you know a few million CPU hours on NASA's Pleiades machine will get you. So, um, so at the end of my talk, I just want to give you a sense of the tremendous progress we've had in the theory uh, amongst us theorists and especially now harnessing the power of large-scale supercomputing simulations to model the complex processes involved in how our universe evolves, and in particular, 
how galaxies evolve. So again, I just want to remind you, starting with the, 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 what we know about the very early universe, the great initial conditions we have from the observations of the cosmic microwave background, we put those into the large-scale computer simulations to evolve the influence of gravity as it's driving the formation of galaxies within the cosmic web. And then we can zoom in on individual systems, is what you're seeing here, and how individual Milky Way-like systems form here. Not just the dark matter, but also how the hydrogen gas comes in. And again, I explained to you how the supernova explosions are causing this tremendous uh, burst of activity in the gas. That gives rise to how disk-like galaxies, like our Milky Way disk galaxy, formed as the gas comes in. And finally here, when we get down all the way down to the present day, after 13.7 billion years, we're able to understand not just the formation of these disk Milky Way systems, but also these tiny little satellite systems that form around it. So again, just to recap, the, coming back to the question I, I put at the beginning of the talk, how do our Milky Way galaxy form? So I hope now you at least have some sense of the story here. Again, basically, just after the Big Bang, we had these tiny quantum fluctuations uh, that were made large during the process of inflation. This seeded slight overdensities in different parts of space that through the gravitational, through the force of gravity causing them to collapse came together. We let that collapse happen over the 13.7 billion years of evolution of our universe. And that brings in all of that hydrogen gas that you saw. And of course, it's around these hydrogen gas clouds, which is where individual stars form. And of course, as you also know, it's around these stars that we form planets, gas giants, and also rocky planets. So this is the story of the Milky Way. And of course, at the very end here, at least around one of these planets, is of course where we form. So this is really, in some sense, just the first half of the story of our formation is, is the formation of the galaxy in which we form. So thank you all for coming. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Andrew. That was really cool. Uh, we have a few, maybe five minutes for questions. So Andrew, you want to take questions? Okay, in the front here. Thanks for the talk, Andrew. Yeah. So we're not there quite yet, to be fair. So um, the simulations you saw here are just able to resolve the formation of stars. We're not yet you know, at the level of resolution, you know, enough elements, enough sophistication in the models to be able to start to resolve how then planets form around them. But we're going to get there. And in fact, it was an interesting conversation I had with a colleague recently of trying to project of, you know, how many years in the future will it take before in these computer simulations we can go all the way from the Big Bang to the formation of planets. And then I think we'll be able to make connections like your question of can we make predictions of where the likely spots of habitable planets form. I think we're about, um, I think we're about 15, 20 years maybe off from there, but I think you know, within, you know, give it a decade or two, I think we'll be able to finally use these simulations to pinpoint that directly. Both. So as the computers get more and more uh, capable, our ability to resolve smaller and smaller scales in the universe, but that means we need to add in more physical processes, because we can make cruder approximations if we're just simulating the largest things. But as we go in smaller and smaller scales, we need to worry about how molecules form. We need to worry about how dust grains form. You know, there's all the, the small scale, well, small scale to the galaxy, nor normal scale to, to us. Uh, all of those processes we're going to need to put in. So it's, 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 it's going to require progress on both fronts. But, you know, it's, it's not unknown physics, or at least we have the basic templates for the physics. So I think we'll be able to put it in at a, at a realistic level. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Question? No, we have put a lot of work into making those nice visualizations. What we get out at the end of the day is just you have you know the positions of all of the little resolution elements, what their masses are, what their you know what the temperature is, you know the stars that formed. It's just the raw 
sort of data products. It's a lot of data. So for instance, the one I'm running right now, each time it writes an output file, that'll be a, something like 100 gigabytes. And so over the course of the simulation now, we're talking more like 100 terabytes. Um, and so a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is how do we translate those raw bits into the nice movies you saw, into the, you know, analyzing them in a way that's comprehensible. So it's a, it's, that's a lot of what we do. Is there questions in the back as well? Um, that tends to decrease. So some of those dwarf galaxies you saw end up, you, maybe it was hard to see from the movie, but they end up falling into the Milky Way and sort of get shredded as they pass through the Milky Way. And so uh, that is something our simulations incorporate, though. Galaxy mergers is when the galaxies come together, but that tends to destroy galaxies. And so it is a thing that's important to model because if you don't include it, you're going to have wrong predictions for the number of galaxies because it is a way to get rid of some of those tiny dwarf galaxies. So um, the simulations are running on the super supercomputers like, like Pleiades I showed you. And uh, so there is hard disk space. There's a giant facility up at NASA Ames up in Mountain View. And it gets written to disk, the, the data outputs from those. And then I log on to those machines and then analyze them from the supercomputers themselves. And so everything sits at NASA Ames facility all the data sits there, and I just log in remotely, like you just saw me do earlier, to analyze it. Sorry? Oh, how do we, what do we, where do we start? Yeah, so that's, um, coming back here is, we basically take the observations of the early universe that my, you know, the observational colleagues do, and basically measure sort of the distribution of matter in the early universe, and we have ways of parameterizing that and how it's spatially distributed. <laughs> And then we use those to generate realizations of, you know, matter, the very early universe. And then that's the starting point of the simulations. And then we evolve that forward with all the physics of, you know, gravity and stars and such. So, yeah, so it's basically taking the initial conditions from the observations directly. Question? How do you design the puzzle? Oh, um, that's, I mean, that's a choice we make. Uh, that's sort of an aesthetic choice at some level of, you know, how do you want to convey this information? So like in the case of the, let me just skip ahead here, in the case of the movie of the hydrogen gas here, it was color coded by the temperature of the gas. So for instance, um, what you see there is magenta at first, that was very cold, and then it got heated up, and that's the green gas you can see here is sort of the warm gas, red here is hot gas, and then as it comes in the very center and, 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 and cools down and becomes like molecular gas, there it gets sort of this, uh, that magenta color again. So we have, you know, we can color code the data by different physical parameters that lets us get slightly different physical insight depending on what it is that we want to understand about the galaxies. If you change the color, you get a different... We give a different perspective. It doesn't change the model. It's just a different way of looking at the data, if that makes sense. Do you have a question? Uh, how long does it take to make those colors? The movie? Yeah. Yeah, the render of the movie, oh, that's a few days. Again, it, you know, there's a lot of data here, so we just have to sweep through. Like I said, this is um, the data set here was probably in the uh, roughly a terabyte of data, so we just have to let it run and render in the visualization. So it's kind of like you know, you go see a Pixar movie; they have computers that 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 render the visualizations. We're using some of the same techniques to go from the the, the bits of the simulation, you know, what the simulation gives us to the to the visualization. Question. I think they're already good enough to predict the future. So actually, there are some of my, I haven't done that as much, but some of my colleagues, you know, you run this down to the present day. We can just let it keep running. So one interesting prediction we've made is we have our Milky Way galaxy. Actually, I didn't do it. One of my colleagues did it. We have the Milky Way galaxy. And if you ever look, it's kind of hard to see with the naked eye. But if you have good binoculars or telescope, you can see Andromeda. So Andromeda is a nearby galaxy that's about the same mass. It's about the same uh, mass and size and number of stars in the Milky Way. Well, it turns out these two galaxies are actually heading right at each other. And if we wait about three billion years, the galaxies are actually going to collide. 
We can measure the velocities between them, and they're going to collide. And then we can, people have actually used these simulations to predict what's going to happen when Milky Way collides with Andromeda, and what's the end galaxy going to look like. Some people call it Milkomeda, although it's kind of a, <laughs> I don't know about that name. But we can actually use that to predict what the combination of the two galaxies will be. And so that's a nice way of predicting three, three billion years into the future what the Milky Way is going to look like. That would certainly, well, it would change, it would, it would sort of change how quickly the universe, how quickly stuff forms in the universe. So maybe we have to wait an extra billion years to form the galaxies like we have. Um, yeah, um, people have looked at that somewhat. So there's the idea that, you know, in different parts of the universe, maybe the initial conditions were a little different, maybe the laws of physics are a little different. There's no evidence for that yet, although it's an interesting hypothesis. So your, your question is, or the answer to your question is yes, that some people have looked at the question, if the initial conditions were just a little different, how different would the universe look today? And uh, it depends on how, you can go crazy, you can make crazy initial conditions and get a crazy universe, that's certainly true. Um, but within reasonable bounds, you get, a, you get a universe that looks generally like ours, it's just a question of exactly when the galaxies form. So I think we're yeah, going to cut off all the time we have right now. There will be more time to ask uh, Andrew questions later. You guys had a lot of really great questions, but let's thank Andrew again for a great talk. Hey, I guess everybody who's still here is interested in asking more questions. So we have uh, four panelists today. Let me just look at the order. So we have myself, I'm Dr. Leo Stein. Um, and I'll let the other panelists introduce themselves. So I work on black hole simulations. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Astrid Lamberts. I work as a theorist here, and I, I don't even know what I wrote there. It's been a while. I work on, stuff on massive stars, gamma rays, and stuff between galaxies. Like, if you look at the sky, most of you see stars, but there's also a lot of black space. So I also study the black space. Uh, I'm Dr. Rahul Patel. I'm a postdoc here um, studying exoplanets, disks, and anything related to that. I'm Dr. Christine Corbett Moran. I study a variety of um, phenomena and simulation. Right now I'm working on how uh, supermassive black holes first formed, um, also using computational simulations. In the past I've worked at uh, the South Pole for about 11 months there. Um, on the South Pole Telescope, observing the cosmic microwave background radiation, um, which we heard about from Andrew earlier, and um, also hoping to be an astronaut one day, so I know a lot about the selection process and the manned, personed, womaned space program in the U.S. Yeah, just if, if you have a question, please just raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I, I, uh, so the question was, what's the astronaut selection program like? Um, the majority of it for most people is just like any other job for the U.S. government. You put in your resume. Um, you need a bachelor's in a scientific field and a few years of work experience. Um, additional higher education also counts as work experience. If you meet those minimum qualifications, um, you can apply, and then you just wait around, they check your references, et cetera, et cetera. Most people, um, myself included, the first time that I applied, what you get at the end of this is a little postcard after they made a selection that says, sorry, there were N thousand applications and it's very competitive and you're not getting in. For a lucky few, um, you do get to go for an interview on site in Houston um, and then there's also a second round interview stage um, and then they make the selections um, and they do that every, uh, in the shuttle era, they do that every year or so. Um, nowadays, uh, there isn't as much uh, funding and the capsules are smaller um, and so it's only every few years that they do that process.
Um, the question was, do we know what the composition is of the Trappist planets, or is there more ongoing work, right? Uh, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Trappist-1 planets are a set of planets, seven planets that were recently discovered around the Trappist-1 star. The Trappist-1 star is a really small, cool, uh, s uh, smaller star than our sun, and these seven planets were discovered recently. Uh, they all fit into a distance between their star that is closer than that of Mercury uh, in our solar system. And they're roughly, they've been measured to be roughly Earth-sized, all of them, uh, slightly smaller, slightly bigger, uh, and almost, there's about three of them that are, that we think, think are in the habitable zone. Uh, we know, we are, get, we, we have calculated the, the density of these, of these objects, you know, the, the, the bulk density of them, and people have been theorizing for, well, since the discovery was made, what they might be, uh, what they might be like based on how much starlight they're getting, uh, whether the star is ver really active, how much X-ray flux is being uh, thrown at it, what sort of atmosphere might be present on these systems. So it's not nailed down, um, but you know, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of ongoing work in that uh, in that respect. a lot of modeling. Um, it's a good question. Um, the on, uh, newer missions like JWST, uh, newer missions like the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to look at these systems in more detail, uh, look at the spectra uh, coming out from uh, uh, transit spectroscopy from these, from these planets most likely. Um, so there's a few different ways and that's one of them. <laughs> um, Andrew can help answer this as well, uh, but I think our current understanding is that we see uh, supermassive black holes form within the first billion years of the universe, and that's also when the first galaxies are forming. And it seems like all massive, very massive galaxies that we've observed also have a supermassive black hole. So they seem to have formed at the same time. There's also a correlation between the mass of a, a galaxy and the mass of its supermassive black hole, so they seem to have some influence on each other. That said, uh, we don't necessarily understand how the first supermassive black holes formed in our universe, um, and some of the dwarf galaxies, particularly um, things that Andrew and other people study, uh, it seems like many of them have uh, supermassive black holes at their center, but it hasn't been verified that every single galaxy has a supermassive black hole um, at its center, particularly the smaller ones yet. So there's still some debate upon the influence of one and the other. There's a lot of ongoing theoretical work. The good news is that there's going to be a lot of um, observational programs, telescopes launching. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope will be able to tell us a little bit more about, an, um, hopefully, as well Andromeda's black hole and addition to our own. Um, so it should be an interesting interplay between theory and experiment in the coming years. Did you want to add anything, Andrew? You're good. I, I can add one thing. So in these simulations, if you start out with, uh, with initial seed black holes that are around 10,000 solar masses close to uh, when, the, when the universe was quite young, then from that point forward, as these supermassive black holes merge together, you get a distribution of supermassive black hole masses that are kind of like what we see in the universe today. So we kind of push the problem back to, okay, but how did we get those black holes that have like around 10,000 solar masses? Where did those come from? There's a big gap. The 
The ones I showed we haven't yet, and the reason is it's hard to do because the 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 size scale that the black holes are actually you know they're doing their action is is incredibly small compared to the scales you saw in a galaxy, and so we just don't have yet the dynamic range to be able to can self consistently form a galaxy from cosmological initial conditions at the same time go all the way into you know we're, now we're talking scales you know smaller than the size of the solar system for the, the the physical scales associated with the black hole. We're close. We're working on it, and you know members of the collaboration are trying to put that in, but we're just not there yet. So there's you know there's other angles you can do. Then is you can do more idealized experiments where you just have a gas cloud that you let collapse on its own, or um, you can um, you can just do runs that only try to uh, uh, model the very early universe that don't go all the way through the 13.7 billion years. Um, but trying to do, you know, the full-scale Milky Way galaxy with the black hole, uh, that's a really hard problem. No, we just, we, we, we don't, in, our, in the code, that doesn't, there's no mechanism for that to happen. When Basically, when things get so dense, we just basically, it be, because we can't resolve the scales anymore, we just don't let them get any denser. So there's kind of like a, uh, a ceiling to the amount of density that things are able to get that they won't exceed. So you're never able to get to those extreme densities you need to form a black hole. It's all there. So I, you know, I'm certain within five years we'll be able to do it, but we're just just not quite there yet. Um, so in my PhD work, um, I, uh, so first of all, dark energy is the mechanism by which we uh, think is driving the accelerated expansion of the universe. Um, and that's certainly that accelerated expansion is, is modeled in the simulations. Um, in some of my PhD work, I actually worked with uh, versions of uh, gravity where you could actually change um, the explanation for where that accelerated expansion was coming from by modifying the equations of general relativity slightly. Um, and what that results in is a slightly different um, version of gravity, even uh, in the Newtonian kind of approximation. Um, and I incorporated that in galaxy formation simulations. So it certainly is the case that people are exploring um, not only standard dark energy models, but also kind of more exotic uh, explanations for the ex accelerated expansion of our universe in uh, these cosmological simulations. Uh, Andrew, did you want to add something as well? So the simulations I showed actually did include models for dark energy. I didn't just didn't have a time to chance to talk about it. But the short answer is that the dark energy doesn't really affect the scales of an individual galaxy like within a galaxy. So like the Milky Way would hardly know that dark energy exists. Mostly where the impact of dark energy is interesting and important is the way, ga the way individual galaxies are distributed on even larger scales. So if I was a galaxy and you were a galaxy, so the way that we sort of see each other and how fast we're moving apart would be influenced by dark energy. But the movies you saw of like an individual Milky Way, it's too small of a scale. Dark energy is really important as you get to, you know, scales of the universe itself. Um, but it is in the model, so it, it is technically incorporated. It's just um, for the scales that the simulations I showed you, it isn't super important. <laughs> I, I can answer that last one real quick. Uh, so the last question you asked was, what is an exoplanet? It's short for extrasolar planet, which stands for a planet that is orbiting another star other than our sun. So it's a planet that's outside our solar system, either around another star or floating by itself. That was the easy one. And how many of them? How many of them? So we've, detect, 
we've detected, con confirmed, roughly 3,540-something exoplanets uh, as of last week or something. You can go on the NASA Exoplanet, web, uh, NASA Exoplanet Archive, which is actually housed right here at the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, um, and play around with the data if you want. Um, so that's the total number of planets so far. And um, as to the, the other questions, um, so what's going to happen when the Milky Way collides with Andromeda? As Andrew was mentioning before, we've been able to kind of predict the future and model uh, based on observational data that we have now what's going to happen, and, and roughly it's going to form a new object, and there's a catchy name for this, Milkdromeda. Um, so I'm glad we live in the Milky Way instead of Milkdromeda. Um, and a lot of times what happens when these galaxies collide is that they each have a supermassive black hole and the question is what's going to happen to those black holes? Are they going to merge? Is it going to be that one is kicked out? And I don't think that we have a comprehensive, we don't have enough data to really figure out what will happen there yet. Um, but it will form kind of a bigger um, milk dromeda galaxy. And as to the question of how many galaxies there are in the universe, I believe that we have like an estimate of that. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. It's 10 to the, I don't know, something, 11 or 12. Andrew, do you know? I can't give you a number, but I'll say we can estimate it, you know, within maybe a factor of a few, but measure, but actually we don't, by, we're nowhere near being able to see all of them because most of the galaxies in the universe are those tiny little ones like I showed, those little dwarf systems. So we can see almost all of the really bright galaxies because they're bright and they're easy to see and you can see, you know, throughout most of the universe you can see them. But the faint things, you can only see the near, very nearby ones. And so you have to make more of a statistical leap to say, well, we see this many in the, you know, in the nearby volume that is so big. And so if we multiply you know, relative to the full size of the universe, we'll estimate there will be this many. But we are never going to be able to directly see all of the galaxies in the universe because so many of them are just so faint that we just can't see them. And I'll just add one more thing to the, the, the some people also get a little nervous when the Milky Way merges with Andromeda, like the sun is going to get destroyed or something. So. Actually, I want to make two points with respect to that. One of which is that merger is going to happen before the sun dies. So that merger will be about two and a half to three billion years, and the sun will last another about four and a half billion years. So if we're still around as a species, that will be the first interesting thing to happen. But it actually won't be that interesting because the stars and individual galaxies are so far apart that they'll basically just pass through each other, and it's not like stars are going to collide. No, no, no. They're just going to kind of pass through the night. And it's going to change the structure of the, of the overall galaxy, but individual stars and individual star systems are going to hardly even know. So the constellations will change, the positions of stars in the sky will change, but like we don't have to worry about the solar system because, you know, the, the stars are so far apart. There's, the question is, is there any chance that they'll miss each other? As far as we can measure the velocities, the answer is no, that they will actually collide. But, you know, there's always a little bit of uncertainty in the exact, you know, there's, we can only measure the velocities so well. So there could be a slight velocity offset. But it, basically, what would be the difference of if they just go splat versus if they go spiral, spiral, spiral in? So they're going to they're gonna merge. It's just a question of exactly when. Three, three billion years. So, so he's asking about gamma ray emitting bubbles at the center of the Milky Way. So gamma rays are uh, a type of light that is very energetic. So we don't, um, we don't, see them here on Earth because the atmosphere protects us, and thankfully. But um, so these, this very energetic light comes from very energetic phenomena, like black holes, exploding stars, things like that. Planets typically don't make gamma rays, or not, not many. And so um, right now we have a satellite observing gamma rays. It's the Fermi satellite. It's been up for eight years. And so Fermi was expecting to see black holes and things like that. And then after four years of data, when they look at the 
beautiful map that Fermi makes. So they see the plane of our galaxy. It's a nice plane. And then there's two big bubbles on top, like two just bubbles. And we didn't really expect that. And so people call them the Fermi bubbles because Fer Fermi was the first instrument to see it. And we still don't really know what they are because there's two options. One option would be that it's made of basically all the supernovae that exploded in the Milky Way, so the same things that Andrew talked about. It's basically, you have these supernovae and they create a wind and that sort of creates the bubble. So that's one idea. Maybe just if you add up all the winds from the supernovae, they make the bubble. The other idea is that Maybe the bubble is related to the supermassive black hole we have in the center of our galaxy. Because right now, the supermassive black hole we have in the center of our galaxy is basically not doing anything, just sitting there. But we think that when, um, that billion years ago, it might have been more active and basically created jets and maybe dust, the, those bubbles were created by the black hole. But as far as I know, we still don't know what actually caused it. Like, we try to have a better idea of what the bubbles are, what they're made of, but we have no firm answer to how we made them. So, pe so people have started to look at, basically people have tried to find uh, bubbles in different wavelengths, so light comes in different sorts, so we only see visible light with our eyes, but we have different uh, wavelengths. Basically, imagine um, people walking. We can all walk at a different speed, but depending on the length of your legs, you make a lot of tiny little steps or just a few big strides. Well, light is in the same way. And so depending on the wavelength of light, you see different things. And so people have been trying to look at the bubbles with different wavelength to s see if they can understand something, but so far they haven't figured out a model that actually matches what they see. It's, we don't have it yet. Okay, so the question was about something called intermediate mass black holes and whether or not there's any observational evidence for them. Is that right? Okay, so first of all, uh, what are these names? So we observe in the universe uh, black holes that are around the size of the, the, or the, the mass of stars. We call them stellar mass black holes. Those are around 10, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun. And we also observe supermassive black holes that are millions to billions, even 10 billion t uh, times the mass of the sun. So in, our, in the center of our galaxy, we have one that's around uh, 4 million times the mass of the sun. And in uh, another not too distant galaxy called M87, there's one that's a billion times the mass of the sun, or maybe 10 billion, I don't remember. Anyway, so there's, there's a gap in between, obviously, which is a kind of a big question of how do you form the supermassive black holes if presumably you started out with stellar mass black holes. So people have hypothesized that there's something called an intermediate mass black hole, which is something like 10,000 times the mass of the sun. It's somewhere in between. And it's also presumed that these would live in these environments called globular clusters, which we have a, a bunch of globular clusters that are going around the Milky Way, and most galaxies have globular clusters around them. Uh, and there continue to be claims in the literature. Uh, so observers say, we observed this object, and we observed how fast things are moving in here, or we observed how much X-ray light there's coming from this object, or how much radio light there is, or other observations. And people have made claims that they've said, we think that there is an intermediate mass black hole in this place in the universe. Um, I don't think that it's 
a consensus opinion yet. I think all of these claims are a little iffy. Uh, there are instruments in the future that will be able to tell for sure whether or not there are intermediate mass black holes where we'll have a smoking gun that yes, the only thing that that could be is an intermediate mass black hole. So there's a plan right now, the European Space Agency is planning on launching an instrument called LISA, which is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna in 2034. So, and, and NASA has, there's, there's some political history and there's money involved, so of course it's complicated. Um, but this instrument would be, would be sensitive to gravitational waves from things that are falling into intermediate mass black holes, and that would kind of be a smoking gun, so we would be certain. It's possible that before that instrument launches in 2034, that we will already have a consensus opinion that yes, there are intermediate mass black holes, but right now I think that the evidence is a little iffy, and I don't, I don't think that anybody would say yes, it's definitely an intermediate mass black hole. Add. <laughs> Why 2034 for the launch date? Yes, the answer is politics. They they plan out their they've planned out their large scale missions. They have this like kind of decade long vision. Um, so they have large class missions, medium class missions, and they had kind of a. You know, let's prioritize the things that we want to learn in, in space. Uh, and that was one of the priorities, but there were other ones that came first. So this one is the one that's scheduled for 2034. Although there is a chance, not, it's not certain, there's a chance that it might be launched in 2028. It's a hope, and let's not get excited. Because... Um, <laughs> So actually, yesterday I was reading a paper from 2000 saying, oh, there will be a new space antenna to detect us in 2010, and we're now 2017, and it's planned for 2030. So, but, so because space agencies plan their major missions very long time ahead, and like they space them by seven of eight years, and so the, one, the mission before LISA is called Athena. It's a big X-ray telescope. But it turns out they're having a lot of problems designing their mission. Uh, the last X-ray telescope that was launched in space miserably failed. And so there has been a, a set of failures in that type of missions. So they are thinking, it's not certain, that they might switch both. Because uh, LISA had a Pathfinder mission, LISA Pathfinder, that was launched a year ago. And that was actually doing even better than expected. And because of that, also because of the detection of gravitational waves, uh, NASA is considering coming back. So there is a chance that they might switch or that it might happen a bit earlier. I, that's probably optimistic, but I don't think it will be very, it, it won't, probably won't be delayed. That's my hope. <laughs> Um, so he's asking about how ca gamma rays could affect us if we were to go to the moon or how would affect operations uh, people. So gamma rays and many other radiation or particles in space are harmful to people, uh, probably to life in general, but I'm actually not that sure you might know more about that. Um, indeed, if we go to the moon or somewhere else we have to protect us from gamma rays, that's for sure. No, I mean, I think what you said is accurate. Gamma rays are bad for life, period. Yeah, so uh, the question is, have we found exoplanets around every type of star, every type of uh, 
size star. Um, and so stars come in a variety of sizes. We have uh, stars like our sun. The most, uh, you know, the most abundant stars are these M dwarfs, uh, stars that are much, much smaller and cooler than the sun, sort of like the TRAPPIST-1 star. And then you have stars that are three times the mass of the sun. And we detected planets on all of them. Um, it depends on what it depends on what type of planets uh, using what detection methods. Um, if we look at the Kepler mission, the Kepler mission has been prolific on finding uh, stars around a lot of sun-like stars. Um, Kepler, <clears throat> they're now finding, now that Kepler is in its K2 phase, uh, because originally it was looking at just one patch of sky and staring at it for four years. Uh, and that got you a lot of stars all at once, like 200,000 stars all at once. But now that its reaction wheels have failed, it's now tracking, its, it's now doing like an 80-day scan at different patches of the sky. Um, and it's finding planets around M stars, uh, smaller stars. Um, so it's, I don't know the exact statistics uh, off the top of my head on which stars are more preferable for the most abundant type of planets. You know, we're finding a lot of uh, super Earths and super Neptunes as opposed to the original hot Jupiters that we were finding in the 90s. Um, Earth-sized planets are still, you know, they're, they're there, but not as much as we'd like. And the statistics on, you know, we're still trying to figure out the occurrence rate of Earth-sized planets. And that was the original goal of the Kepler mission. In fact, if it had continued on its original track, if the reaction wheels hadn't failed, with another two more years of data, we would have been been able to tackle that question easily. But that's not to say that it's not it's it's impossible. There are a lot of teams analyzing the data as we speak, um, and they're getting different results, but they're converging in one direct in in you know you know in a in a direction in a, in a direction for Earth-like planets at one AU, right? Because that was the original mission of Kepler. I guess I have an opinion. Um, so I think, well, at least we're all here tonight because we're curious about the world, um, probably not just about astrophysics, but about biology, about our place in the universe, about our families, about, you know, what, what are we, where did we come from? So I think that's one of the impactful ways. It's just it impacts our cultural consciousness. Um, there's also a variety of ways which... Uh, astrophysics uh, impacted, for example, the dinosaurs. Um, so we had uh, what we think is an asteroid wipe out um, an entire species. Um, astrophysics, or at least solar physics, has historically affected our, our climate, um, the evolution of the sun, understanding how suns evolve, um, understanding how our original planets came. But as for like you know, billion year scale questions, how the first supermassive black holes formed might not necessarily impact your daily life, but really understanding that or understanding the first seconds of the early universe uh, requires understanding things like quantum gravity better. Um, and every time we have observed in a new wavelength or um, unlocked a new understanding of fundamental physics, electricity and magnetism, um, gravity, etc. There's been a huge number of inventions that impact our daily life that come from that increased understanding. So I think science is one of these beautiful things that we can follow our curiosity, but also have faith that um, some percentage of what we discover will um, transform our lives in unexpected ways. So I... I'm, this is supposed to be astrophysics panel, not a philosophy panel, but I, I just wanted to jump in and say, you know, I like to go to the museum to look at art just because it, you know, it, it makes my life feel better. 
I, you know, I, I like seeing some beautiful things. I like to go to the Huntington. They have a lot of really beautiful flowers and, and wildlife there. And I think the same thing is true about learning more about the universe on a you know, giant scale. You know, it, learn about how big the universe is and how tiny we are in comparison to it. And it, it just like makes me appreciate how, you know, uh, on one hand, the universe doesn't really care about us because, you know, there are violent explosions going off everywhere and space is so harsh and we can't live in most of the universe. And on the other hand, we're living here on this planet that's protecting us from gamma rays and we get to live in a time when we can have access to telescopes, have access to laser interferometers and study the universe. And that's another way that, you know, my life is made richer and more beautiful by learning about astrophysics. So I'll just offer one other answer to this question, which is why should we care? So in the, when the simulations I showed you, when we start them in the early universe, essentially all we put in in terms of normal matter is hydrogen and helium gas. That's about it. That's all that really exists to good approximation. There's trace other elements. So it's number one and number two in the periodic table. That's the two lightest elements. So as you may know, your body is made up of a lot more than just hydrogen and helium. There's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, magnesium, iron. Where do those come from, right? Those were all baked in the centers of stars. In, in the higher elements, those were baked in the explosions of these fantastic supernova explosions. So if all that stuff you saw in the movies in these galaxies didn't happen, you and I or I wouldn't, wouldn't even be here to ask this question. So, I mean, it, it sounds kind of esoteric about, oh, galaxies, whatever, but that's how we formed. Literally, that is how we formed. And so, again, it's just sort of our place in the universe. This is like, like, kind of like step one to the question of where we came from is like this, how we go from the Big Bang to, you know, galaxies and then, you know, go all the way down the chain. But, you know, it matters to understanding, you know, even things like where our basic building blocks of the elements came from. Ha, ha, ha. Is there a question? Um, possibly, although it's, it's a bit tricky to answer because the, the, so we, the, the simulations I showed you include dark matter, but they include the most sort of basic vanilla version of dark matter, which is a particle that just interacts through gravity, nothing else. There are alternative models for dark matter that could have interactions with other dark matter particles or weird interactions with normal matter. You can, you can bake up whatever sort of model you want, and theorists do bake the, up these models. Um, so we can, we can run those alternative models in the simulations and see what kind of galaxies they produce. And some of them produce galaxies that aren't, don't look right. They're, they look bad, they look, or they, look, they don't look like the galaxies that we observe. And that's evidence that maybe those models probably aren't correct. The simplest model we put in, which is only gravity, works well, and that's what you saw there. And as far as we can tell, that, that model works as well as any other model. So it may be true that the most boring model works. It's just gravitational interactions. It's all dark matter cares about. It may be true that you need to invoke something more interesting and complex and and, and we're looking for evidence of that, but at least so far as that we can tell, fr from the perspective of the simulations, you just need, you know, the, the most boring version of dark matter. But I mean, we're, I think our hope is that we can use these simulations as test beds in the, in the future for, for other models of dark matter as well, because that's sort of how you can take a general model that you just bake up one day and then actually fold it through that complex formation and see what, what galaxy it produces at the end of the day. So in some ways, we think of these simulations as laboratories for translating ideas into sort of testable predictions. Um, the question is, can we predict the existence of virtual particles? Um, 
So usually when we talk about virtual particles, we're thinking about uh, sort of particles that are very short-lived on very small, tiny, you know, atomic, microscopic, quantum scales. The simulations I showed you aren't resolving in detail the tiny, tiny scales and the scales of, of, of molecules. We're sort of just doing an approximation that, that we can sort of lump all that together and sort of model individual stars as our sort of pixel or as our resolution element. So the answer is no, we can include those much deeper, much more complex quantum mechanical models. We sort of have to use a, a more approximate uh, model that just gets the large scale stuff right. That, and that's just, again, just we, we don't have enough uh, computational power to do that yet. But we're, you know, the idea is we can eventually push towards there. Uh, nevertheless, all this fundamental quantum physics does come into play in that uh, we think the CMB was generated by quantum fluctuations, and in addition, in the very early universe, um, how matter uh, kind of combined from like the primordial soup from the Big Bang to actually form atoms, um, how that process happened is very sensitive to our models of quantum mechanics. So there are connections from the small scale to the big scale that um, we'd have to deal with in our simulations if um, a theorist came to us and the community said, hey, we agree now that um, the particle accelerators have told us that quantum physics doesn't work like we used to think it does. It works like this. Um, we don't, as Andrew said, like actually resolve those in our simulations, but certainly they do affect um, uh, the initial conditions of our simulations and how we interpret our simulations in that if our simulations were completely off from the expectations of what we understand to be uh, quantum physics predictions, then our simulations would be wrong and we'd have to go back to the drawing board there. I can also add that there are people that do do that do supercomputer simulations uh, of the quantum fields themselves. And they've, but they, they do supercomputer simulations where the size of the box that they're simulating is basically about the size of a nucleus. So they're trying to figure out whether or not, um, just by looking at the standard model itself, uh, it's just, you know, the, the model of particle physics, whether they can figure out, you know, how much mass should there be in a nucleus, in a neutron, or in a proton. And those are, you know, our friends across the street who work in high energy physics are doing those kinds of simulations. So that's, you know, the smallest simulations and all the way to the biggest simulations. They're, they're using some of the same techniques. Kugelblitz. Yeah, so the question was, what is a Kugelblitz? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's good. So we have a German speaker here. Yeah, so, so this is a term that, um, that has been used to, uh, to mean a black hole that was formed by basically focusing a whole bunch of light all pointed in the same direction to a point. And it's true that if you did this, if you, let's say that, you know, we took huge numbers of lasers and focused them all down to a point, then in principle, there would be so much density, so much energy density in that tiny point that it could form a black hole. Um, and I am not going to calculate it right now because I would probably do it wrong. There is a blackboard, but uh, I don't want to bore you. <laughs> and it would probably be messy and wrong. Um, but yeah, that, that is a correct prediction of combining the theory of general relativity with the theory of, of light. Um, and, and light itself has energy density. So light curves space-time according to Einstein's theory of general relativity and the more energy density you concentrate into one point in space-time the more it'll get curved so if you focus enough energy density into a small enough region then it's inevitable that you'll form a black hole um, and it could be made out of 
light. It could be made from uh, the center of a star when it's you know, burned up all of its nuclear fuel and the core collapses and it makes a supernova. And you could form a black hole at the center of a supernova. Um, you could even, in just general relativity alone, without any matter, you could take gravitational waves and focus those down to a point and get those to collapse into a black hole. So that's just part of general relativity. It has this thing that's called nonlinearity that gravitational waves themselves can focus down and make a black hole. I'd like to say that uh, thanks to you, I've learned a new word. <laughs> no idea. And that's a good point. As you can see here, we all have our different areas of expertise. A lot of them overlap, um, but scientists are always learning and discovering, and we're not like infallible. We just learn and discover and try to iterate on our models. And um, yeah, it's cool. And um, you know, you don't need to stick to what what is written over here. You can ask us anything. <laughs> 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 um, this is a bit tricky because it isn't actually the field I, I work in. Uh, the question is, what do you most hope to discover? Um, but I hope that in my lifetime we come up with a theory of, of quantum gravity. I think that that would be um, very neat to resolve some of the puzzles. It also would be great to know what exactly the dark matter particle is. Um, so both of those things would be very exciting to me. Um, more kind of concretely, uh, I'm working on this problem of how the first supermassive black holes in the early universe formed, and I think with tools like LISA and upcoming um, uh, space telescopes being launched, we might be able to actually answer that. So I have a little more hope that we'll understand that in my lifetime than quantum gravity, but um, you never know with, with people like Leo and other people working in gravity, uh, what might happen? <laughs> I'd like to try to figure out how to effectively convince people that uh, scientists just don't make stuff up. <laughs> I think that would be a, a good goal to, yeah. I actually don't know. I, I, I've been thinking about this one. Like, mm. to fo I, focus on the current work. Yeah, I... I definitely like to understand extreme things in our universe, things that we are not able to create on Earth. And I like to understand how we, in the universe, we have gas that is, in certain parts, flowing at the speed of very, very close to the speed of light. And you need tremendous energy to do that. And this is something we don't understand. And I would. I think, yeah, I think I'd like to understand how that works, how we create these extreme things. I'd like to know that too. But uh, I also want to know uh, whether or not there's a reasonable model of quantum gravity. That's, that's kind of one of the holy grails uh, for me, except I shouldn't say holy grail because everybody that went to go questing for the holy grail died. So... <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so my, so I, I want to know whether or not there's some other theory beyond general relativity that does a better job of explaining nature. And so far, general relativity has passed every test that we've thrown at it. Um, even the most extreme tests, which were, you know, just last year, which was that. We've observed black, two black holes crashing into each other. In fact, we've observed that more than once. Um, so I think that the best place to look for whether or not general relativity is a good theory or whether or not it needs to be corrected in some way is in that most extreme situation where black holes are crashing into each other. So that's what I'm simulating right now. What happens if you change the theory of gravity a little bit? What are the observational differences between two black holes crashing into each other in general relativity or in a slightly different theory. 
Um, so I'm hoping that those predictions, if we see anything like that with LIGO, if we see slight deviations from general relativity, that maybe that could help some really smart people towards building a better theory of quantum gravity. So, I mean, I think that a lot of, I, I would very much like to know the answer to all of the questions just put forth. I'd say the, the three that really strike me as, as interesting and sort of an increasing, in, in principle, the time scale for answering them will get longer and longer is, you know, we want to know what the dark matter particle is because we know it's there, we can see its gravitational influence, but yet we don't know the particle physics behind it. It's very frustrating, sort of it's just beyond our reach. But it is only just beyond our reach. So if we, we may be able to see it in the laboratory tomorrow, and then we'll have the answer. It may take a decade. It may take many decades. Dark energy is a, is a, more, is a little bit farther away in the sense that we have even less knowledge of what it is and, 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 and how it, what the particles, if you want to think about the particle nature, the basic theory behind it is. It may actually require um, a theory of quantum gravity before we even have like the framework for understanding what dark energy is because it, 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 it's so, it only influences things on a very large scale, so it's difficult to measure. You can't, it's not obvious you can measure it in a lab. That said, these are two things that in principle we definitely will, we can have answers to because we know they're out there. I think another super interesting question, which I think everyone is interested in, is there life beyond Earth? The, this is a tricky question, though, because it's not actually obvious whether the answer will be yes or no, and even when we will know. Like, obviously, if we discover it, it would be great and be like, okay, we, you know, we see evidence for it. But as long as we keep not seeing evidence for it, there's not, like a, there's not necessarily a detailed particle physics level understanding of can life arise or not. Then it becomes probabilistic. Okay, what's the you know, chemical composition of the star, and how long has it been that way? So... You know, that, that's a question we might answer tomorrow, or, you know, we may never answer it because we'll never look at enough other planets to be able to answer it, right? So, um, so that's just by way of things that are interesting and then what I think are the sort of time scales. For uh, so my original answer was a sort of a cop-out so I could think about uh, <laughs> what I actually... <laughs> um, <clears throat> but to expand on what Andrew said, um, you know, beyond just life, I'd like to know... What is the re you know what what are the most common type of planets that that nature forms readily and around what type of stars um, and I think once we can figure that out we can determine the frequency of you know Earth-sized planets and even habitability. I didn't even get to the first one. <laughs> no, no, go on, go on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So your, your questions are, do I think, do we think that Mars will be habitable? Will be, not was. Well, right? The question is, I just want to make sure I'm working with the right time frame here. So that's a, so you, you say you're working for NASA, you're working on the Mars 2020. Explain to me what Mars 2020 is. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. What is Mars 2020? Well, basically, right now, what we're trying to do, we're basically building the prototypes for the new uh, rovers. And, okay, <laughs> thanks. So we're basically bu building the prototypes for the new rovers, right? And... We hope to be able to send it, uh, these new rovers in order to allow us to collect more uh, science material. So maybe one day we'll actually be able to 
go to the next phase, right, which is basically creating the right infrastructure to actually send people there. So that's one of the things that we're doing right now. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, and a better explanation than I would have been able to convey to everyone else. Um, as far as whether or not it's habitable, I haven't studied, I, I haven't looked at any of the documentation outlining the plans. Um, so you know a lot more about the actual mission than I do. All I can say is, you know, if you would have told uh, people in the 19th century or early 20th century, let's build, do you think we can figure out the, uh, you know, the basis for mass in the universe? They would have looked at you like you're crazy. And here we have a massive particle accelerator called the uh, LHC in CERN. You know, the, and, and then they would have, a question that would have been posed are, well, let's see if we can find these massive black holes that are colliding with each other without having to detect their light or any light. You know, to most people, I, I would imagine that would have been an impossible task. And so if you start off with, you know, if I give you the answer of, uh, a defeatist answer of, I don't think so, I know, there, maybe, I, I don't know. It doesn't really give anyone hope that it's possible. And I think we've shown throughout history that we can achieve things that are impossible to the perspective of our current selves. And so I don't think it's, an, uh, I don't think it's a matter of whether we will be able to, but... How long will it take? So, um, I can also answer this a little bit. So I was down at the South Pole, which has a person based down there, uh, supports up to hundreds of people in the summer and about 50 people over the winter. It has temperatures that are sometimes lower than places on Mars. It does have the advantage that you can breathe the atmosphere and it's a little closer to rescue, to support. Um, that said, it's an extreme environment, um, and we've shown by going to the moon that we can at least visit another planet and handle that technologically. Um, so I think with Mars, it's more a question of budget, and uh, certainly we'd be able to have a base there. Now, the South Pole base is not self-sustaining. Um, it's constantly resupplied in the summertime, and it's self-sustaining for short periods in the winter. Um, so I'd imagine the early Mars efforts would be similar, where uh, you might have resupplies, people self-sustaining for a short period, maybe a longer period, but then resupplies, resupplies. Um, now, the Earth doesn't necessarily get resupplied with anything but solar energy from the sun, et cetera. Um, so developing like a self-sustaining civilization on Mars will definitely be a lot more difficult um, than it has been on Earth. Um, so yeah, fundamentally, I think reaching there and forming a base there is a question of budget. Of course, there's a lot of technological development that needs to be done, which you're doing and other people that are uh, out there are doing, um, but I think we we saw with the the moon Apollo missions um, that when we uh, put our minds to it and have the money and the backing and the political will to do it, we can do really great things. Um, so, yeah. To expand on that a little bit, um, have you seen the show The Expanse? That that so when you asked that question, that was in my mind, uh, and so that I, I I think you know if we if we expect the future to be some, somewhat like the expanse, I think we can do it. <laughs> we, hopefully without, hopefully without, yeah.
Um, so far, mathematics seems to be much richer even than the universe. Mathematicians can imagine things in millions of dimensions, doing all sorts of strange stuff that uh, physics can't even predict would ever be relevant. Um, and so far, it seems that um, almost every phenomenon that we've been able to observe, um, either there aren't enough observations to be explained by a mathematical theory, we're still kind of collecting them, or we can incorporate them in, in mathematics. So um, as to why there's this intimate connection with being able to describe the universe with math, um, some subset of math, um, that's a question for philosophers. Um, so we don't exactly have an a priori reason why the universe should be that way, um, but it seems so far um, that it has been the case. So I imagine because mathematics is so rich and actually much bigger than actually the physical universe, uh, physical universe is boring compared to what mathematicians can come up with, but like some subset of math is perfectly adequate to explain our physical universe. So I don't imagine that being the case. Um, but it would be extremely fascinating if there was like a bug in the physics universe where there's kind of like this sci-fi, right? There's this like bit of matter that's just not explained by math. Um, so that would be really, really fascinating. Um, but it doesn't look to be very probable at this point. I think we have to um, wrap up here or else campus security will kick us out anyway. Um, if you have any last burning question, maybe we'll take the most important question that's left. This is the most important one. one. One more, one more, last one. I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna take that. <laughs> so, I'm, so don't spoil this for me. Going back to sci-fi real quick. Um, I'm reading Asimov right now. Uh, uh, so you see where I'm going. Um, I haven't gotten to that point where you're all ooing about, but I know it's, I know it's there. And so there's an idea of you know, a deterministic approach to understand the universe, where if you know the position, velocity, and all this stuff from the beginning, like uh, with Andrew's, uh, simulations, if you know the initial conditions, you can map out the behavior of all the things in the universe. Uh, but when it comes to people, you know, we're kind of not really deterministic. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> we could do a poll. I think you could... I think, I think we, we... could do it. But, like, a lot of people have different opinions. But you can model that. But, you, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we, I, I cannot say what he's going to do. But out of ten people, I can probably predict that four of them are going to pick this, and six of them are going what to pick this. Who's the thinks that, that we one day will be able to mathematically predict people's decisions? If we have enough information about their brain at any given point in time, who thinks we could predict their actions with good accuracy? That's the majority of the question. Could you predict that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> we, we, we do have to shut down, but I think it's kind of, it's actually optimistic, because if we can predict it, that means we could like eventually upload our brains into computers. And so, but if we can't, then we'd never be able to actually f do that with high fidelity, in my opinion. I, 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 love, I love the optimism, and the polls obviously show <laughs> one direction, but I've seen polls before. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, um, so we're going to wrap up. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, let's thank all of the panelists. And remember, the next one is next month here, June 2nd.